All right, it is uh, 6.30. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, could we have a roll call? Taylor. Here. Tinsley. Present. Walken. Here. Young. Here. Ingram. Present. Rector. Here. Summers. Here. Harper. Stan is unfortunately out planting soybeans right now, so he will not be here tonight. Um, motion for approval of the agenda. Mr. Rector. Second. Taylor. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, approval of the minutes from May 7th. Is there a motion? Motion. Ms. Member Walken. And second was Stringer. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Passes. Uh, public participation. Um, first one I have is John Berge. Hello. My name is John Burgey, and I'm a citizen of Champaign and just a concerned person. So I'd like to say that when considering new capital projects, we as a county need to get the right expertise in order to get the most bang for our buck. Good leaders do not have to know everything, but they should be savvy enough to find the right answers. Points I would like for you to take away from me tonight are to know that Excellent design does not cost more. In fact, it pays dividends. There are lower maintenance and lower overhead costs. In our community, we can make use of expertise. And I would like you to know that the University of Illinois has offered its expertise to this community in honor of its sesquicentennial and its next 150 years. And it has called on us to make use of its, its expertise, okay? In a community of our, such as ours, we are fewer than six degrees of separation from expert assistance. I'm sure the College of Civil Engineering can help us with construction contracts and construction management. We can get the most bang for our buck. There's an opportunity cost when we waste dollars on buildings that prematurely age and unnecessary costs associated with poor design. Lastly, for the jail project, I would like to specifically recommend the, we get a request for a proposal from architect Jean Gang. Jean Gang is a U of I alumna and an architect who specializes part of her practice in community-focused design. I have provided each one of you with handouts highlighting some of her civic design ideas, and I encourage you to look through them. I believe she could reconcile many of our community's design needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martel Miller. Martin Miller, a banner resident. I'm calling to come up here to talk about the jail. And I know we're not going to stop the county from building the jail, which we've been working on for probably, I'd say, about eight to 10 years, trying to stop a jail from being built. But since we're going to continue to build this jail, I don't want no more extra beds. Let's get extra beds. That means you got to fill it. Um, I would like for the county to look in having 100%. Uh, early child learning, put some money into people instead of a building. You know, if you start out kids with um, early child learning, um, they won't be behind and they they can get very well educated because instead of starting school behind, you get kids in school at three and four years old. We got to have 100% early child learning in Champaign County. We got to make that happen instead of building the jail. And if we do build a jail, build a jail with programs, with classrooms where not just come to jail to set around, come to jail to better your life. You know, if you go to jail, you got to come out of there with something. You got to have some GED classes in there. You got to have some resume classes in there. You got to have some parenting classes in there. You got to have anything to help somebody to better their lives, not just to lock them up and leave them, you know. 
Television is all right, but education is more than all right. It gives you something. Um, I'm just hoping this county board do the right thing for this community. And like the guy say, use expertise. All our, both of our jails is under probably 40 or 50 years old. And the average jail in Illinois 10 years ago was like 75 to 100 years old. We got two brand new jails compared to the rest of the state. And both, we got one that we're trying to condemn and the other one we're repairing. So it's up to y'all to make it happen as a county board to give us the, the, what we need as a, as a jail and work for the community. And like I say, it needs to have programs. If it's having a new jail, no program, lead a jail just like it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Okay, uh, Ron Kester. Hi, my name is Ron Kester. I live at 1209 West Oregon Street in Urbana. Um, I want to amplify and echo some of the comments Mr. Miller made just a moment ago. Um, I've been participating in and watching the jailing debate and issue about the jail now for, I guess, about seven years. For me, it starts in the spring of 2012 at a particular meeting of the county board, and that was when our current state representative, Carol Ammons, who was on the board at that time, stood up and took on people on both sides of the aisle and challenged them that this was not merely a bricks and mortar issue, that this was a policy issue. And in particular, she wanted to know why African Americans were six times more likely in, the, in Champaign County to be in jail than Caucasian Americans living in Champaign County. And that was a, an important argument. Um, and it's an important moment of soul searching when the county board says we want to build new jail space. Because what you're saying is we want to take the number of options that we have as a county when dealing with transgressive behavior and put our money on jailing. Because when you put your money on jailing, whether it's 25 million or 35 million, those are the policy options you're going to have available. Jailing is going to become the policy option for the police, for the state's attorney's office, for the judges, for everybody. If you take that 35 million and say, instead, we want substance abuse treatment, because we see a strong correlation between transgressive behavior and substance abuse. So what we're going to do is create a treatment center and then be aggressive in going out and finding people who have those problems before the transgressive behavior shows up and becomes worse, before there are victims. That's what you can do, and suddenly we have a new range of possibilities and policy options in front of us that we don't have now. And as Mr. Miller said, if you want to invest it in early childhood learning, that's another set of options and tools that we have now to lower criminality in Champaign County that has a strong track record in other places around the country. If you want to go a little bit off the beaten path and be a little bit more creative, you can say, we don't think that policing and the criminal courts and jailing is going to get us a better community. Those are emergency services. That's what happens when everything else fails. When everything else fails, you have to use force and put people in cages. That's our option now. That shouldn't be our option. What we should be saying is, what can we do? What kind of a plan can we do so that people who might be committing transgressive behavior, who might be victimizing other people, can be identified and stopped before it happens? And that involves, and there are some models out there to do that. If you want to go explore it, com community ambassadors and community organizers can do what the police can't do. They can be talking to families and identifying problems and getting people to talk them out through restorative justice and other tools before violence takes place. So that people put the gun aside and say, I want to talk it out instead. And that can make a problem that goes on for 10 years become a problem that's resolved within a year. All right? And the county can have a role to play in that too. I don't want you to think that all you can do is make buildings. You can make programs as well. And programs that do address crises so that you don't have to have these very expensive options in front of you instead. These are policy decisions, all right? These are policy decisions. Two that came to mind for me that I want to leave you with today um, that I learned over time in studying this issue and, and as a volunteer at the jail as well as a volunteer in criminal court hearings uh, in the courthouse in downtown Urbana. What I've observed is 
that first of all, if you go to the sheriff's website and look at what people are being held in the jail for, what they're being charged with, that's a policy issue. There's nothing empirical about those charges. And if you follow a case from beginning to end, you're gonna see those charges change probably. Some of them will be, disappear, and the state's attorney's office will say, we're no longer gonna pursue this. Others will change and say, instead of calling it this, we're gonna call it this. So what I want you to understand is that there are people behind the scenes making those decisions, right, to put people in jail and to charge them with the crimes they're being charged with. The second policy issue has to do with cash bail. And that's something that we've seen a lot of change over the last few years. So if you look at the statistics and you see that there are fewer and fewer people in jail, the reason why is because the issue of cash bail has been changed and the policies about how it's being implemented. Cash bail was designed to be an option so that somebody could put a substantial amount of money on the table and that would ensure they kept going to all of their hearings. They didn't need to be in jail to do that. And people decided to say, well, why aren't people being able to pay that amount of money? And so they started to reform the system to review that matter and say, we wanna make sure that you do have the ability to pay so you can be outside the jail with your families, in your communities, instead of in jail waiting for the hearing, if you can. We wanna make that a credible option. So we've seen that policy change take place at the state level and implemented at the courthouse, and suddenly we have fewer people in jail. Those are the kinds of choices that you have in front of you. It's not merely a bricks and mortars issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Uh, Nilafor Shambayadi. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nilafor Shambayadi from Cusco, now in Beijing again. And excuse my voice, I'm just trying to recover <laughs> from a cold, uh, from a bad cold. <clears throat> uh, oh, I mean, I. First of all, I wanted to say that I have not been aware of where the discussion is at this moment. So um, I try to be kind of as general as possible, uh, but also whatever I say, I have documents to back it up with. I have data, whether local or national, I go to the sheriff's site every single night and look at who's there, what are the charges. And just this is a, a segue, but relates to what was said previously. Um, the majority of people who are in jail are in uh, kind of charges that are goes from domestic battery, battery, aggravated battery, all those cases, and it shows that we don't have a mechanism in our society, in our community, to deal with these issues. Schools are a great place. Community centers are a great place. So um, I just wanted to you know, basically agree with the gentleman before us. And another issue I want to say is that um, today I'm speaking on my own behalf. So what I say should not be taken as representing any group's uh, viewpoint. And the uh, other point is that <clears throat> uh, some people may be totally against any changes in the satellite jail, um, but you know I have spent a lot of time inside and I know that there are some needs and those needs uh, remain unmet just because this whole issue of expansion is uh, um, a hot issue actually. So, we, and then we don't have the we can't close down the close the uh, downtown jail unnecessarily because we say we have to expand the uh, satellite jail in order to be able to close uh, this jail. Uh, so I'm not one of the people who totally are, is against expansion. I know we need a room for programming, for example. And I know that there are people there who are not pretrial. They are serving their sentences up to one year, right? And I want to see them to be engaged in some physical activities, you know, some more programs, you know. And mm, so that's where I stand. But my problem with what had been in the past uh, um, presented to the board 
uh, is that um, there is the issue that we can't close down um, the downtown jail, which is not true. We can, and there are various, um, very simple steps that can be taken to accomplish that. And as I said, you know, I have all the numbers. And uh, another issue is that the laws that have recently been passed and also the momentum in our Illinois all indicate that we can actually reduce the population of pretrial uh, incarceration uh, in this county. And uh, just from the Bail Reform Act, and then uh, there is a Supreme Court uh, High Commission, which is in charge of coming up with recommendations for overhaul of the complete, uh, complete overhaul of the pretrial uh, system in Illinois. So, and then there are more of those um, opportunities. And it feels not very wise to use this time to talk about jail expansion. I rather see money be found, whatever way we can, to really attend to the needs of the people, like it's crisis center, mental health centers, and um, all the other uh, services that was mentioned, and there are even more of that. And another reason, I, I see that I don't have much time, but I just touch upon it, is that um, they say we, they don't have enough space to humanely take care of the mentally ill. And I think this is a wrong premise because it shouldn't be uh, two options of either just holding this, letting these people rot in the jail or um, having like a humane, compassionate prison or jail. This does not work. And I have all the details that why this is such a bad, um, plan actually, uh, it really doesn't work. So it's uh, so much better to focus and to um, find the funds to um, pay for or invest in our people actually. That's an investment. Medical, all kinds of services that are lacking would help us reduce the jail population. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Shambayadi. Uh, Alan Axelrod. So first off, uh, rest easy, there's no stats in this. So there was an earlier remark about how design pays dividends. There are dividends in good design. Best design practices don't take into consideration only one element, but the entire interconnected system. So we need to take that into account when we're looking at potential investments of county resources. For example, if we want to consult who at the university would be good to approach for looking at the use of these resources, I would suggest anyone who is familiar with stochastic control, which takes into account uncertain actuarial costs for born over time, as well as the benefit of continuing to pursue a certain course. Weigh that financial analysis against doing any sort of infrastructural overhaul so that we know that this is a good decision to make. We can also take a leap out of the probabilistic risk analysis done from the nuclear engineering department, among others, where they look at the interplay between systems that operate on rules and humans. And they look at, for example, what is the probability of human error in this system and what sort of dynamics does that cause? This can be looked at both in the terms of preventative services to prevent people from um, getting into uh, incarceration in the first place. It can also be looked at with regard to um, 
things like improper convictions or um, the errors in maintenance that could cause additional costs. But apart from additional consulting with other departments in engineering other than civil engineering, there's also one thing that I wanted to say when it comes to uh, rehabilitative preventative programs. There's a city called Aarhus in Europe. They've accepted ISIS fighters back into the community, paired them up with mentors, and it's worked. So much so that security researchers in Switzerland acknowledged it and said that that model was by far the best that they've seen. So if we're looking at what is an effective model, we should be looking at mentoring programs, I think. Because that, those people that were involved, chances are they were involved in some extreme violence, worse than here, in any capacity. So if that program can work there, why can't it work here? Let's actually have some researchers answer that question before we decide that that is something we should write off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Axelrod. Uh, Lynn Barham, we got garbled there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lynn Branham. I'm a resident of Champaign. I'm also a visiting professor of law at St. Louis University. My expertise has centered on correctional law and policy and sentencing law and policy, um, but in the past few years, I've been focusing on restorative justice and practices and got a master's uh, in that. It also bears noting that for 16 years, I served on the Commission on Accreditation for Corrections. 14 of those years were as the American Bar Association's representative. So having uh, participated in over 700 hearings where conditions of correctional facilities were at issue, I am well aware of the challenges and the importance of having a jail that um, meets constitutional requirements, is humane, and importantly, is operated in accordance with best practices. So I found out about your meeting today, and it felt very much like Groundhog Day uh, for me. Um, so I came up for air from work about oh, a little over an hour and a half ago, and I was tempted to just dust off a speech um, that I gave in February 2015. Um, but instead of just doing that, because the point's very point, bear repeating. I, I just want to emphasize and, and bring to the forefront, because I, I see some new faces um, here, two key recommendations. First, any master facility plan must be part of a master system plan to revamp and improve the criminal justice system in Champaign County. And that system plan must reflect evidence-based practices. That master system plan would, for example, include provision for pretrial pre services to move us away from pretrial detention that is grounded on how much money a person has to an objective uh, research-based assessment of risk of failure to appear for court proceedings and risk to the public safety. Another example of what would be included in a system plan would be a provision for the integration of restorative justice and practices throughout the criminal justice system from the front end to the back end. Doing, doing this would give victims a voice that they do not have in the criminal justice system. It would also provide an opportunity for those who have committed crime, for those who have harmed others, to be held meaningfully accountable for that harm. I would relish the opportunity to talk to you more about that at some point. Without the tendering of a system plan in conjunction with a facility plan, any facility plan should, I would strongly, strongly advocate, should be DOA, dead on arrival. It should be summarily rejected by the taxpayers. That is how important this is. Second, I'm recommending that um, that a criminal and restorative justice coordinating council be created to help develop this system plan. Uh, there are coordinating councils like this across the country. 
they are comprised of key stakeholders in the criminal justice system. So for example, the sheriff, um, I don't, I'm not volunteering you, but he would need to be on, on the council. Um, there's, there's a judge and so on and so forth, and members of the public. And what this council would do is develop a, a, a system, recommended system plan with, with a lot of public input uh, and then monitor the implementation of that plan. The creation of this council was recommended by the Champaign County Community Justice Task Force, of which I was a member, in 2013. In 2017, the Racial Justice Task Force, of which I was a member, recommended the formation of this coordinating council. This has not occurred. I will renew that recommendation today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close uh, public participation. Uh, communications. Anyone? Seeing none, uh, on to new business. Item A is the uh, county jail consolidation discussion with our sheriff and staff. Would you come forward? Good evening, everyone. You all know me, but just in case you don't know, my uh, jail superintendent, Captain Kerry Vogus, and our uh, chief deputy, uh, Shannon Barrett, so are joining me here tonight. Um, I have not uh, got a formal presentation to give to you, but I am more than happy to say some things and uh, answer any questions, uh, keeping in mind that this is my, what, seventh month on the job, I think, at this point in time. Um, and there is lots and lots and lots of information that I have been reviewing over that seven months um, to give me a little bit of history on the direction the county has tried to go before and which direction we want to go in the future. Um, you know, I was listening to some of the public participation earlier, and I can absolutely relate with some of the things that were being said. Uh, many of you may know my master's degrees in criminology, and so studying why crime occurs, crime theories, those types of things, is kind of my niche. Um, if you all can solve our criminal justice system's problems, I will buy you all dinner at Alexander's. Um, there is such a complicated issue when it comes to our criminal justice system. In fact, sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my head around my responsibilities here focusing on the jail as opposed to trying to solve the entire criminal justice system's problems. So with that, I will say that this endeavor um, that the chief deputy, the captain, and I have started getting involved in over the last seven months as far as what to do with our correctional facilities is a multifaceted approach. Not only do we need to close the downtown jail and have a facility that meets the needs of the citizens of Champaign County, but we also need to have that community approach as well. Um, simply having a jail will not solve our criminal justice problems. Um, we also, and, and you know, one thing I did not hear tonight so far, and I'm not really surprised about it too much, is that we are doing a lot of good things in Champaign County as far as criminal justice system goes. We're working with mental health, to develop new programs to divert those who uh, may have mental illness, to get them out of the jail or prevent them from coming to the jail in the first place. And I'll admit, just from what I know, we're at the beginning stages of that. But it is something that's on our, uh, on our radar. I realize that the fewer people who come to my facility, the better off those people who didn't come to my facility are going to be in the long run. When they see the jail, we have failed as a society and keep keeping them from the criminal justice system. I get it, I realize that. I am passionate about helping those people before they get to my facility. I am also a sheriff of this county. I am also responsible for properly maintaining the county jail, which I am legally obligated to have through the Illinois Compiled Statutes. 
and providing a safe environment for both inmates and my correctional officers. It does not matter if I think that inmates in our correctional facilities should not have a good facility, if they should be thrown away and uh, locked away and thrown away the key, or if I think they should have 57,000 cable channels. I am responsible for providing a facility that is safe for the citizens of Champaign County by law. That brings us to our conversation today. If, if we have liability in the county, chances are it's gonna come from my office. Right, civil lawsuits come from the jail all the time, and it seems like we learn something every time that, uh, that that a lawsuit's filed. Same can be said with the sheriff's office as far as patrol out on the street. Our goal for the correctional facility, when we close the downtown jail, if things go the direction that I believe they're going to go, we will actually reduce the bed space that we can currently house at the two facilities at the given time. Our problem is not amount of beds. Our problem is the amount of space or the usable space that we need for the people who are incarcerated today. I would absolutely love to work with Judge Defanis, Julia Reitz, and get more alternatives to incarceration. I am one cog in that very big wheel, but I am continuing to work on that. So we need to focus on this jail aspect at this point in time. Um, what we have envisioned for the jail, and this is kind of, you know, just, just some ideas that we've been throwing around. This is very, very, very early uh, in the stage from what I consider. Um, lowering our capacity, having more usable space. We deal with mental illness all the time in the jail. We deal with gang activity all the time in the jail. Yes, we need to start diverting people from criminal justice in kindergarten. We need to start keeping people from the criminal justice system, right? But even if we started that today, I still have people who are committing violent crimes who are coming to my jail that I have to appropriately house. Um, with mental illness, I don't want any mentally ill inmate in my jail. We have had a breakdown in the system over the last several decades to where now it's either the emergency room or the jail. We are not gonna solve that overnight, but I continue to work on it. Right now, we have to focus on the mentally ill inmates that we do have in the jail until we get that system going. Some ideas we've looked at. So the special management housing management housing that we can deal with the problems we're going for right now. Why do we have to have, why can't we just close the downtown jail and go and move everybody to the satellite jail? Because some people in our jail want to kill each other. They are the same ones who are shooting in the cities and in the county, shooting at each other. We are locking them up and we have to keep them separated. Mental illness, my booking area right now is full of people who have to be supervised more than regular inmates, and so they don't get the exercise that they need, they don't get the, um, all of the accommodations that they need because we're trying to squeeze them all into spaces that weren't made for spaces for these inmates. That's the situ situation that we're looking at right now with the county jails, and most of you, if not all of you, did a tour of both our facilities here a couple of months ago. Um, many people are surprised, you know, we keep using this term expansion, and though the satellite jail would likely end up being bigger square footage if we close the downtown jail, I don't, I, I, ver I hesitate very highly to use the word expansion because that to me means more beds. And I agree, if we have more beds, we're gonna have an incentive to fill them, right? but we're not looking at more beds. We are looking at reducing the bed population, and I've been working with Dana and, uh, and many of you on, on these plans, and I'm, I'm, I'm honest when I'm saying, for me, this is the very beginning stages of looking at how we need to progress on this, right? But those are all the things that we're looking at. We, um, some ideas that have been thrown around with the captain, and, and we talk a lot about this. You know, um, I'm for one, my philosophy is a jail shouldn't be a place that people wanna come back to, right? There's, there's a stigmatization that needs to come with a jail because it needs to be somewhere where we don't want people to go. However, let's use for an example, let's say my mother makes a bad decision. One night, drinks too much and starts driving home. She gets a DUI, she gets brought to my jail. 
I don't want my mom to be stigmatized for the rest of her life for what she saw in that jail because chances are she's not going to break the law ever again anyways. So we've talked about a softer booking area for some of those instances. We've also talked about the potential for, um, and this would have to be strategically planned, but for an example, a big, uh, I'm a big proponent of expanding programs. Celeste, who we've hired a couple of months ago as our programs coordinator, has really started looking at the programs that we can offer in the jail. We offer a lot of programs in the jail, but there are a lot more we could offer, but we simply don't have space. Many of you probably remember seeing the closet that Rosecrans operates out, out of whenever they're there, right? Or the small mental health facility or the, or the small medical facility. We don't have room for those things. Heck, at the satellite jail, we don't even have a library. We have to cart in the books whenever inmates are going to use them. So those types of instances. The, the captain and I have been throwing around the idea of, um, of um, face-to-face, or uh, I, I can't think of the exact word with visit, visitations, um, for let's say fathers and parenting classes. Because one thing that my criminology background will tell me is that if something's going to keep somebody from breaking the law, it's those familial attachments. Right? It's the kid that you don't want to be away from. It's the wife or the husband you don't want to be away from. And I think it has to be strategically done, which is why we talked about maybe a parenting class and then having those those face-to-face visits as opposed to video or glass in between you. Right? We have no room to do that even if we wanted to right now. We don't have the facilities to be able to expand on some of those things. Um, you know, I mentioned before, we're continuing to collaborate with the community. Um, I urge you that when we're looking at this decision, and it is not one to be um, taken lightly, but I encourage the facilities committee and the county board that this is a decision that we need to make sooner rather than later because the ADA has already said we're in noncompliance. They could at any time come in and say, for an example, you've got 30 days to get within compliance, millions of dollars for the downtown jail. Judge Stefanis, in his final words on the bench, could say, I'm closing the downtown jail, find something to do with those inmates. We cannot move the downtown jail inmates to the satellite jail. We'd have to house them somewhere else, and we're looking for 100 to $125 a day per inmate to do that. I am worried about liability because now I get sued, right? When something happens, I get sued. So... Our facilities at the downtown jail, holy cow. The first time I saw that, we can't even use our rec room because the tiles are irreplaceable, right? We don't have money to do that. And the inmates, as much as I can stand up here or sit up here and say, you know, I don't really care about inmates, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. I have an obligation to care about inmates. And inmates who can exercise in a rec room are less likely to take their aggression out on other inmates or correctional officers. That's why I care about our facilities. So as we continue these conversations, and for no presentation, I sure am long-winded. As we continue these conversations, I guess I want the facilities committee uh, to know, and the public to know, that this is not just a jail issue. This is a community issue as well. And whether you see it or not, we are working on that aspect as well. Lynn Canfield is here from the Mental Health Board. Today we met, we were talking about uh, an innovative approach that Urbana and County are going to start taking um, out in the community before people go to jail, right? I mean, we're, we're working on all of these things. So I would encourage that if anybody has questions about some of the things we're doing, come and talk to me instead of just speculating about some things that, that maybe have gone on in the past and uh, may not be the direction that we're taking at this point in time. Thank you, Captain. I won't take up as much time. He took up all my time. Um, You guys have all been in the facilities, so you've seen uh, what we deal with on a daily basis. I can tell you I've lived and breathed 15 years in this facility, and um, I actually had a young man who came to me the other day who was incarcerated at the downtown facility, and he said to me, what, and he called me by my name because we know each other. He's been coming in and out, and I, I work with him a lot, and he's like, Carrie, What can I do to help you get the community to understand that there will be people coming to jail and I deserve to have something better than I'm in? I said, you know, I I understand that. Um, I'm constantly focusing on programs. We have 
I know people in the community don't realize how many we have, but we have 23 programs as of the first of the year, and we're already at 27 to 28 programs attempting to try to get them all done in one classroom. It's been very, very um, challenging. We've been able to bring programs to the, to the forefront that people have asked for in the community, like art, parenting. We've just recently brought a lot of that, which has been a huge um, opponent to a lot of what we're getting back on feedback from the guys that are incarcerated and gals. Um, but I cannot tell you enough that we know the downtown facility is in need of repair. Um, dealing with the constant door issues and security issues that we're dealing with, Finally, Dana, I'm going to knock on some wood that we're not having any issues with it right now, but doors were just popping, and you know what a security risk that is and a concern we have. The biggest issue that I have, and like the sheriff said, we're not looking necessarily to expand and create more beds. I'm looking at a way that I can take the individuals that I have at the downtown facility and bring them to the satellite. One area that often the community looks at, they can look at the website every day, they can look at the numbers that I currently have, um, even if I have 120 people at the satellite and my, my max is 182, because of our current gang issue, because of protective custody, if someone comes in custody and they do not want to be around other people or they're possibly incarcerated for something that is a sex crime, they do not want to be around indiv indiv individuals. If they have a medical concern, often I'm having to separate people because they do not want to be around others, and that also causes issues. Right now we're using the downtown facility for mainly individual housing. With that said, there's no way I can bring those individuals out and legally house them um, with someone else. So it's something for us to think about. Um, do you guys have questions for us? I don't want to continue to talk about what you guys know already, um, and you guys have all been through both facilities. If you do, we would love to answer questions. How's it going? Thanks for coming Hi. and giving us this presentation. Uh, I don't know if you have the information on hand now, and if you and if you don't, uh, shoot it to me whenever. But like, did you have like a ballpark percentage of uh, inmates that might be incarcerated doing uh, their actual sentence at the county jail, like a, a non felony? Like they're doing under three hundred sixty five days. Yes, like I can that. actually send you all that. We keep stats on who I have <coughs> currently waiting pretrial, currently sentenced to the county jail, um, and we keep track of all that, which is actually a fairly low number. Um, compared to the general population, um, but we can we can present that to you guys whenever. Send it to the group. Okay, I, I know. Like, uh, I'm not sure when last time we spoke, but I know you guys were taking like steps towards uh, lesser harsh sentences for like nonviolent crimes to to keep the influx of. You know, Correct. We'll use the, um, the home incarceration program often for a short sentence, something that might be minor. Um, I also. Um, Every month, we'll review and get an update on anyone who's currently incarcerated with a minor offense or a bond of less than 10000 um, mainly because we want to keep individuals out of jail if they have a small bond. There's no reason for them to be there. Um, keep in mind, they did, as I mentioned earlier, we have the new Bail Reform Act that came out last January. Um, we see people leaving, but we really don't have a large number leaving. Um, I know my fellow cohorts in different counties saw a huge number. Um, Sangamon County, they lost like 40 people immediate from that bail reform. We have an option, though, that we don't have very many people in that are staying on minor charges and or Category B. Okay. Um, but it did. It did show a little bit of an impression for us as far as getting a few people out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. I will, uh, can I add real quick yeah, to that, yeah. Charles? I'm sorry. Um, I will add one thing I didn't mention, and the, the captain kind of reminded me of it earlier, is, you know, when I was a deputy in, in 2008, um, in 2009, we were arresting people for simple possession of not necessarily just marijuana, but cocaine, heroin, et cetera, right? Um, it was pretty commonplace to be arresting people, arresting people for driving with a suspended license, right? was pretty commonplace in taking them to the jail. I think it's important to note that we have basically stopped that. Everybody, almost everybody in my jail has had a shooting incident. They're in there because unlawful use of weapons where they were shooting at each other out on the streets, sexual assault with a kid, um, all of those types of things. And so we're actually incentivized to keep those out of jail who don't need to be there because we have so many violent criminals who the state's attorney and the judges have determined need to be remanded until, they, uh, until their trial. 
and, and we don't have anything to say with it. The judge says, remand him to, the, to our custody, right? He says, sheriff, take him, and we have to take him. We can't say, sorry, Judge Stephanus. Anybody who knows him will find the humor in that, right? He's not a guy who's up for negotiation on who he's going to remand to our custody. We have, we have very violent offenders um, or those accused of very violent crimes in our custody on a daily basis. Back to you. Okay, so um, with that saying being said, uh, Sheriff Dustin, um, explain to me and can you flush out, the county jail was designed just for a temporary stay, right? So what happened in regards of what 365 days they go to, they get sentenced to where? I mean, just flush that out in regards of, do you see a large population coming back in regards of them being uh, rehabilitated within the programs there and the ones that end up being sentenced to um, a higher defense criminal activity sent off? I will say that, so we house, primarily, we house two different types of offenders. Pretrial detainees, those who have been accused of a crime, they can't afford their bail, or the judge has decided they need to stay in custody, or those sentenced for misdemeanors up to 365 days in jail, right? Now, we may have, temporarily, those sentenced to the Department of Corrections, but we get those out as soon as the Department of Corrections can, can come and pick them up. So... Do I do we see now I have no data in front of me to back this up, but the criminologist inside of me says we see a lot of recidivism because our criminal justice system sucks. You know, you put somebody in jail, you realize you put somebody in jail, they're taken away from their work, they're taken away from their kids, they're taken away from all of those things that make them uh, at least potential to be successful. And then it's a cycle, right? They go to our jail, then they get sent to prison, and they lose all those things. I don't know an employer who's going to hold a, hold a job even for a couple of days for somebody who doesn't show up, right? And so that's why I'm passionate about keeping people from jail if we can. Um, and it's hard for me to focus on that little aspect because I need to focus on our jail facility. But I would say, yes, we see people go into Department of Corrections, and a couple of years later, they come back, and they're back in our facility for another crime. No data in front of me to back that up, but experience tells me, yes, that's correct. Um, one thing to speak on, though, is we have taken a large um, step towards helping from the door. So as you guys know, we have Rosecrans, uh, the Champaign County Mental Health Board has been gracious enough to put money towards things like this. How can we get people from not coming back to jail? How can we do things like that? And they have partnered up with Rosecrans, who comes into our facility, and they work two full-time people um, trying to gather that information and help them from the door so when they get released. I'm also part of the Reentry Council of Champaign County who works with individuals upon release from a county jail sentence or a prison sentence, both. So we attempt to get information from them before they even get released so we can connect with them upon release. Because half the time they're needing housing, half the time they're needing jobs. Um, I also just recently met with a group of individuals that are trying to do a new um, bond plan to try to come in and bond out people who have bond that's less than 5,000 met with them, and they're looking at ways to bond out people possibly um, that have misdemeanor charges. So we are constantly, even though sometimes maybe the public doesn't realize it, attempting to get people out of jail that can get out or stop the recidivism rate that's constantly been continuing to grow and try to stop that for Champaign County at least. Um, I, I, I've heard of cases where like, um, you guys have sent maybe like inmates to other counties to do like maybe weekends or something like that. But those are like nine, I mean, for the most part, those are like pretty minor offenses or, or pretty minor sentences. Like, um, would that necessarily be applied to more or less major offenses? Like where, um, I mean, like you guys are short on room here, so like maybe you're in the process of a trial or something like that inmate could maybe be gone, like be sent to like a lesser, you know, a uh, packed county jail. You know, one of our surrounding counties, like, just to at least get through that legal process, you know, uh, is, is there any, like, cooperation with any other counties, like, to work towards that or something like that? Like, so I have, I have a good relationship with our other sheriffs and jail superintendents. Last year at this time, I actually had a question from the board as to if we had to close the downtown facility right now, what would I do? Um, and we had to go through my population, look at the classification, classifications, and I started calling my fellow cohorts saying, hey, if I had to, what would you do? 
um, very few jails anymore want to take on someone else's responsibility and liability because they have their own. Um, I have a few here and there that would say, I'll take five, but I'm only going to take five of your best. I don't want anybody that has a medical problem. I don't want anybody with a mental health problem. I don't want anybody with a behavioral problem. Um, so and we found that I could maybe take a couple to Pyatt, a couple to Kankakee, a couple to Ford, but then I'd have to have some type of a transportation team to move them back and forth. Um, in my tenure of 15 years, we've used other counties mainly when I have to actually separate people. So we've had some um, fairly significant crime or certain cases in Champaign in the last 10 years that there had been like seven co-defendants. There's no way I can separate seven just within our two facilities. So I've had to send two to Pyatt, two to Ford. One case alone, I had three at the satellite, two downtown, two at Pyatt, two at Ford, which is costing us money to have them there just because they cannot get along. Um, the only other time I house out of county is if we've had a situation with a gentleman who's possibly got tuberculosis. We don't have that as an option um, to, to house in our facility because I don't have a reverse fill of room. Pyatt County does. Um, but we haven't had to use another county for overcrowding or for any other reason minus that. But we could, but it would be kind of difficult because no one wants to take them. I, I imagine it would. You have like commissary issues as well as, you know, like you said, transportation. It's just, uh, it's just an issue of like, you know, having that comparable data from a comparable data point. There have been some instances that I'm aware of that, for an example, um, if we had somebody arrested in Champaign County that was from a different county, the judge may allow them to serve their sins in a different jail as opposed to us. In that case, they could keep their job and then work the weekends, or be in jail on the weekends and then work their job during the week. Um, from what I heard, and I'm not an attorney, um, but what, from what I've heard is being housed in a different county could also potentially hinder the process because it limits the access an attorney can have, a defense attorney can have with, with a client. Um, but I've just I've just heard that from time to time. Mr. Director, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all three of you uh, working under these circumstances, the constraints of these buildings. Um, and Dustin, I really appreciate you being candid because it's not expansion; it's it's doing the right thing. And I know most of us up here have done the tours, and that downtown jail is an embarrassment. And you know, you talk about more programs and the classrooms and bringing in all these things. It's like we, we have an obligation, everybody in this room, to do the right thing. And it's not about putting more people in jail. It's taking care of the circumstances. And, and again, we can talk about this all day long, but I want to thank the three of you because this separation issue is the key issue. And I try to explain it to people. And then once you have a few minutes, they're like, okay, I understand. But again, the buildings don't allow us to do that. And we have to have a solution. So you know, we can talk all day long, but it's the three of you out there that are going to really need our, we, we need your help and you out there telling the story because you give it even more credibility than, than we can. So again, being on county board, we're all trying to do the right thing, but I apologize for the constraints that the three of you have to work under. Thank you. Mr. Ingram. Uh, I can't remember from uh, the list that I was provided at one point of the programs, and I don't think we asked during the uh, the last tour, um, is there, as somebody, uh, public comment brought up earlier, um, is there a, a, a mentoring style program that is happening currently? We have a couple peer-on-peer -peer support groups. Um, we actually have one that's getting ready to start tomorrow night, um, which is going to be Celebrate Recovery, which is peer-on-peer. So we're constantly adding new ones. Um, peer on peer can kind of be, can be difficult at times because you have to be able to clear someone to come into the facility. Um, but we do have different mental health. Um, MRT is a class that talks specifically about some of those issues and things. Um, but out of the 24 to 26, we have quite a few. And I have no problem actually sending you guys a list too of what all is being offered in the jail. Yeah, that would actually, I'd, I'd love to see that because I think, I think at one point I had one and I, Remember, couldn't remember offhand if there was something like that, um, but I'm glad to hear that. And uh, you know, looking at things like uh, you know, in town first followers. Um, you know, when you look at even documentaries and things like the Interrupters in Chicago, working very hard to you know talk to people about the things that are happening um, within their communities and and people that are on the on the backside of that stuff that can actually speak to saying you know like 
this is this is doable. This is you know we can work this out. Um, I think those things are super important. Um, and I'm I'm super happy that we have uh, public participation. I'm super happy to have y'all here tonight, um, especially a few months uh, into all of this. Now you have so much extra perspective uh, as a sheriff. Um, so it's it's nice to have this this conversation. I think all of this is super important, and I think everything that was brought up during uh, the public comment partic uh, participation period was was very handy as well. Um, because as all of us are thinking about this on your end and on ours, um, obviously uh, we do not have an unlimited source of, of money, but um, you know, I think the attitude that exists that, well, they shouldn't have got picked up, uh, that's, you know, we, we don't need to provide anything for them other than a bed. I mean, I think that's, uh, I think that's not only is that doing citizens of our county an injustice, but it's, it's doing us an injustice down the road anyway, because we're, if we're not helping people who do have to be there uh, via judge's order, or, you know, if we're talking about violent criminals, like, uh, there's a lot of work that can still be done to, to make their lives better that will theoretically pay off for all of us down the road. So um, I just appreciate everybody's input, and I appreciate you guys coming today and talking about that. So thanks very much. Anyone else? Well, Dustin, I want to let you and your staff know how much I appreciate you being here so that we can have this dialogue. Um, we truly need to be able to understand what the needs are before we move forward in this. And uh, this is part of the process and the first step. And we need to figure this step out before we move on to any other step involving funding and design. We need to know what, what we need to be doing. And uh, I appreciate you being here to talk with us. Thank you. OK. Uh, item B, update on ITD 2019-003, the courthouse column-based modification project. OK. Uh, thanks, Steve. We started this several months back. It's been out, it's been advertised, posted on the web. Um, we've talked to several contractors who we know will be bidding on it. Um, we talked to several other contractors who felt they needed more time. Um, because of, again, the, the hours that this work was gonna have to be done, primarily either late at night or very early in the morning, take your pick, um, it's gonna escalate uh, costs. Uh, because of that, and they just wanted more time to figure out if they've got the staff to be able to, to do that and, uh, and put together. So uh, what we agreed to do was extend the uh, bid opening deadline to uh, next Tuesday instead of the 31st of May. Um, so we'll open bids at that time. Um, and I apologize that that takes th this body out of um, approving the award, but the award will still go to the Cole County Board uh, similar to what happened uh, last month. So um, apologize for that, but we just felt like uh, we need to be in a position where we can uh, try and, and uh, up the ante in terms of uh, uh, get as many contractors involved in the bidding process. So um, anyway, that's our, our quick update. Um, I included uh, for you that packet that was set on your desk, just a quick uh, project schedule. So you can see that the uh, bid opening date was moved to the 11th. Uh, as well as the uh, uh, one and only addendum to the uh, contract that was sent out to uh, anyone uh, interested in their project, as well as posted on our website uh, that the bid date was moved uh, to the 11th. So any, any questions? Keep rolling. Uh, approval of contract award for ITD 2019-004, the Brookings Pod 100 roof replacement project. Uh, in that packet, uh, it's labeled as C, Contract Award, Brookings Pod 100, Roof Replacement Bid Tab. Uh, you'll see that we uh, received five bids. We actually had uh, seven people who had picked up plans, uh, and we had a, a running dialogue with uh, those seven contractors, actually toured the facility. Um, we did not contact uh, Henson Robinson uh, Company or uh, Top Quality uh, to see why they did not choose the seven. Uh, to submit a bid, uh, but we felt like we had five pretty good uh, bidders. Uh, judging from the bids, thank you. 
Yep. Um, I felt like the, you know they were with within good ranges of each <laughs> other. Uh, ACR uh, here in town, uh, formerly Advanced Cane Roofing, it's with Kyle Specialist. Um, uh, they also uh, with a little bidders on the um, uh, JDC roof, but uh, uh, felt like they've got uh, submitted a, a, a good good bid for us. Um, second document right behind this one is just a, a letter from our uh, architect, IGW. Uh, and his recommendation after uh, talking to them further after the bid to confirm uh, everything in their bid, um, he feels strongly that, uh, that we should accept uh, the award as well. So uh, with that, any, any questions? Oh, sorry? Uh, ACR? All right, since we're... Approving the contract for it, I need a motion. A motion to approve. Second. Okay, Ms. Taylor and Mr. Ingram. Uh, any any discussion on this? Any further discussion? Hearing none. Then uh, so we're all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, same sign. Motion passes. Okay, uh, update on ITB 2019-001 Art Bartell Road sidewalk project. Okay, if you drove in today, you'll see that there's more sidewalk been laid out on, on Art Bartell. We're down to just the last few feet. There's five small sections uh, that we've been waiting on utility boxes to be lifted. Uh, Scanlon will be arriving tomorrow at 7 a.m. Uh, to finish uh, forming those uh, five areas. They'll pour tomorrow. Um, what will be remaining is the earthwork that needs to be done uh, with the tall hills they've cut into. They've got to cut those back. We'll reuse that dirt in other areas. Um, they're still going to have to bring in a significant amount of uh, black fill uh, and put in uh, around uh, both sides of the sidewalk. Um, my guess is that's probably a good six to ten days of, uh, of work. Obviously, we can't do it when we're slinging mud, so... Um, I'm hoping that they uh, deliver a significant amount of, uh, of black dirt uh, tomorrow since it's going to be dry. Yeah, I've explained to uh, the company that the, the next seven-day forecast is pretty ugly around here for lots of rain. So um, uh, they were fairly receptive to that. Um, weather has been a real issue with them all over the state, but uh, we'll at least get the sidewalk done uh, and completed tomorrow, and, and then hopefully by middle latter part of the month to have everything completed, their earthwork and uh, uh, seeding of the uh, grass adjacent there, so. Out of <clears throat> just curiosity, uh, now that it's popped up and um, we're seeing it as we're driving in, I was super curious as to why, I think right right by the home, uh, it, the sidewalk jumps over to the west side of the road and then back across again, and I, is, was that, were we not allowed to be on what is now going to be uh, private property of the nursing home, even though this was for them, or I was just curious? Well, at some point we had to jump back across uh, the road uh, to get to, uh, our main goal was to get to where their sidewalk uh, ends in their parking lot. And we really couldn't have done that if we kept going the other direction. Plus part of that part, uh, part of that, um, ground over there uh, directly south of the nursing home belongs to the park district so we would have had to have an arrangement and contractual arrangement with them and, and we just chose to keep it our own property and, uh, and cross over twice so it it made it simpler yeah any other questions okay hearing none uh Update on the courthouse chiller condenser replacement. Also in that packet, uh, you will see, unfortunately, a, a purchase order uh, for $21,004. That's uh, for the compressor, uh, one of four up on the rooftop of, uh, of the courthouse. Uh, that went bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this was uh, sent to them on the 16th of the month. We hope... Uh, that next week 
we'll get a compressor and a crane out to the courthouse. Um, we're trying to get that in before uh, the really hot weather hits. Uh, we're good up to about 85, 87 degrees. Uh, if it gets hotter than that, uh, without the compressor in place, there'll be some areas within the courthouse that, that may uh, be a little warmer or more humid, uh, probably. Um, but we're okay with uh, you know uh, temperatures up to, up to 85, 86. So it's those higher temperatures that will cause us an issue. So um, we're on it with Davis Houck. Uh, they know, uh, you know how busy that building is and the importance of, of maintaining uh, that building's uh, temperature. So uh, we'll get it done as soon as, as soon as it gets here. Any other questions? Any questions? Randy. Me again. Uh, what was the, do you know approximately the age of the one that went bad? Was that back to? That, the that was the, one of the original ones. We've replaced two up there, and uh, the last two, one just went bad. So um, 2002, I think, is when that building was built. I can't say when the chiller was in for sure, but without looking back at the documentation, the constructions. So, uh, but yeah, that was unfortunate. That I didn't really look up expectancy ahead of time, but seems a little short. Is that am I wrong in thinking that um, we should have expected a little bit better out of that? I would uh, I would say there's a little bit of a design issue with um, with how the HBC was was done, and, and in particular how close the two chillers uh, were placed to each other on the roof. Um, they're within. Um, six feet of each other. Um, when a chiller exhausts uh, heat from trying to produce cool, um, it exhausts it up. Well, what happens is it's also being pulled in from the sides. And so um, prior to about a year ago, um, it was pulling in 10 degree hotter air. So it was making the two chillers uh, work a lot harder. Uh, we looked. We we worked with uh, with an engineer trying to come up with a inexpensive way. Whether we throw some additional stacks on top of of, of the blower fans uh, to get the uh, air uh, higher up, so it doesn't get sucked down in from the sides. That's problematic because how do you service those uh, fan units? Well, you service them from the top, so you can't just put a stack on top of there. So. Um, it might be look like Rube Goldberg, but it's a pretty inexpensive way. Basically, we used um, plastic sheeting uh, in between the two units and uh, not allowing uh, either unit to suck in that, uh, that air that's being exhausted. So um, we've run the temps. We've, you know, just we've got temperature guns, so it's easy to do. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting a lot, a lot better use and efficiency out of those chillers. But uh, they also have a little older uh, running time on them now because of that. So um, it's also mechanical, and mechanical, you know, stuff happens to to mechanics. So I mean, it's <laughs> it's the way way of the world. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, update on courthouse locker installation. Yep. Sheriff will like this. Uh, lockers are here. They actually arrived. Uh, Friday afternoon late. Uh, we unboxed them this morning, uh, put them together, so there's uh, four stacks of six, total of 24. Uh, they're being stored right now in the, in the basement. We took measurements. Our staff will be putting together and building a, a base to be made out of metal. Um, there's not really anything that the lockers came with to attach them to anything, and where they're going uh, by the pay station, there's no hard wall to be able to attach them to. So um, our plan is to, is to build a pretty significant base, uh, get them off the ground about uh, five to six inches. Uh, we'll attach that base to concrete. It will not be movable. And then we'll attach the lockers uh, internally underneath uh, to that base. So uh, they'll be tied down and in, in pretty good shape. Um, went through the mechanisms, uh, very easy to operate, takes a quarter. No, you don't get your quarterback, uh, but you are provided at least with uh, with an opportunity to, if you brought a cell phone or something else that's not allowed inside uh, the courthouse, an opportunity to house it. 
at, a, at an inexpensive cost. Uh, but we did look around, and it was just very hard to find something that doesn't cost you anything to get in the hope that you're going to get your key back. So uh, by investing a quarter, we hope that they come back and pick up their stuff and, and get our key back. So uh, fairly, fairly inexpensive. Uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> We do not have one. The parking pay station does not give change either, uh, but it does take credit cards. <laughs> Andrew? For every item. Uh, am I correct that currently until those are installed, the lockers at the uh, across the street are still functional, right? They're yes, still they are still functional and in the sheriff's office who's uh, desperately uh, wishing that I'd get this done quicker. Cool. Uh, is there a plan? I would assume, um, as much as we've talked about it and as much as it's been in the news, I would assume that there are still some people out there who will probably, before they even go into the courthouse to maybe be told that there's a new spot, they might just go across the street. Maybe it would be a good idea once those lockers are gone and the new ones are up. Um, not that everybody reads everything all the time, but to have something there that says that they are now occupied over there so that there isn't I, uh, I I know talking with the sheriff staff and, and the sheriff briefly that um, he's going to be producing some signage both for the locker area as well as I'm sure for his shop uh, to notify people. Um, the media has contacted us, uh, uh, two local media outlets have called us and, and I think they want to come over and take pictures when the lockers are installed so uh, we'll help and get the word out uh, through the media uh, as well. Um, it's hard to believe that the media want to cover small 24 lockers, but that's, you know, that's fine. That's free uh, communication. Yeah, I think um, any amount of reduction we can take on whoever's sitting at the front desk having to answer the same question over and over again, although it will still happen because you can have the, you can have it on the door when everybody walks in, you can have it where the lockers used to be, but there will still be some questions, but at least that will maybe mitigate that a little bit. I have also um, sent an, e so Janie and Lori from Court Services and the state's attorney, they've all been kind of, I don't want to say involved in the process, but I've kept them updated throughout this. And so I have let Janie know to start letting her clients, um, anyone who may take advantage of the lockers, um, to be prepared for this transition. It has been an ongoing conversation for about two or three months that they've known about it. And so hopefully they've been telling anybody who may be using those lockers, hey, be prepared because one day this transition will happen. Um, the sheriff's office, though we're not in the process or we're not in the business of supplying quarters, we do have a register there. So if somebody has a dollar and they don't have a quarter, they can come over and get four quarters for a dollar, walk right over and, and use it. And then that, uh, that quarter that they would put into the lockers, um, we're going to have um, the county make up a fund where that will go back into maintenance of the lockers then. So they'll hopefully be self-sufficient. I do want to thank uh, Sheriff's Department, uh, Dana Yu, um, I mean, for, for listening not only to public input, but our discussion that we had here. Um, it's, been, it's been nice to actually have something that was needed to change, have a relatively quick solution that will help people who, you know, that's, that's servicing some people that, uh, you know, that's a, that's a service that they're going to need. So I, I really do appreciate everybody's work on that. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, other business? Hearing none, uh, I have no uh, report. No, I didn't prepare one. Sorry, short notice, I think better next time. Steve, uh, the, there's additional copies. She passed out one sheet, and it's actually three sheets, double-sided. So it's total six pages. So you only receive one and two. So make sure you grab three and four and five and six. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rosales. Uh, designation of items to be placed in consent agenda. I believe that would be 6C. And that's it. We are adjourned.